My name's Nigel, Nigel Barachoff. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, CallSafe, as you know. Some people have seen me on my soapbox about this before, I'll cover that. There's a tiny little bit of repetition from that, but uh, we have made some progress and there's a few nice little extra bits I'm going to be adding in as well, because this is a masterclass that's aimed for first aiders and it's at the first aid level because we're all first aid trainers and it's about how we apply it in the classroom, okay? You've got an unconscious casualty who's unresponsive to pain, but they are breathing normally. So, the first aider should either A, do a primary survey only, or B, do a primary survey and then a secondary survey. And there we go, loads of people answered B. Okay, so the vast majority of the room think the answer is B to that. Okay, so I've been on my soapbox about this since 2014. I have made some progress since then, and you might have noticed some subtle changes um, uh, to the recent iteration of the latest um, uh, regulated first aid at work qualification. We actually only teach the secondary survey in the first aid at work qualification on the syllabus. It's not, don't get taught on, um, on emergency first aid, top, on emergency first aid courses or even paediatric, it's not on that syllabus either. Um, uh, the slight changes that we got to do uh, were to do with the guidance behind the secondary survey and we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, the key purpose of this talk is to talk and discuss the rationale behind those changes um, and why I've been on my soapbox since 2014 um, and indeed of course look at how we can then implement those uh, discrete changes in the classroom. Okay, But first, it would be absolutely negligent of me to talk to you about the secondary survey without first talking to you about the primary survey. And indeed, you as teachers, it would be negligent of you to be covering a secondary survey in your class if you've ne really not got your students brilliantly doing a primary survey. Okay. And of course, the reason for that is that the primary survey covers life-threatening conditions, doesn't it? Um, so we've got to identify and rule out and treat life-threatening conditions. So we need to do the primary survey first. So actually, I am going to look at the primary survey first with you before we move on to the secondary survey. The primary survey, you'll see it come in lots of different guises. We use in the books, as you know, DRABC, you'll see ABCDE, which clinicians use, which is dysfunction and then exposure examination. Um, uh, you'll see doctors ABC, you see all sorts of different versions of this. Um, people swap D for defibrillation, all sorts of things. But they've all got three things in common, and that's those three little magic letters, which is A, B and C. When we were looking at what we should put in the books, the clinical team at Qualsafe, we decided to opt for using DRABC um, because it fits perfectly with the acronym that we've been using for years and years and years with um, CPR. So it fits well with that. You're teaching exactly the same letters to repeat over and over again. Dr. ABC, Dr. ABC, Dr. ABC. Um, you could argue that um, uh, when we talk, the, the primary survey, it's about dealing with life threatening conditions and getting, uh, ruling out life threatening things. And you could easily argue that, well, the most, <laughs> the biggest dangers that we need to be talking about are life threatening dangers. So if, there's, if your life is at risk, then you shouldn't be going anywhere near the patient. Um, and indeed with response, that's really useful to do a response and check if your patient's responsive because if they're not responsive, that instantly alerts you to the fact that when we move on to the next letter, airway, there could potentially be more problems with the airway than you first realised. So actually it fits really well, does DRABC. Uh, we, we think in first aid that's a really nice, simple um, uh, primary survey acronym to be using. Primary survey um, is for identifying life-threatening problems and then we can safely move on to a secondary survey to look for other problems, non-life-threatening problems. We still need to identify and do a full check of your patient though. Okay. Uh, another thing you might have seen is C, A, B, C, of course, yeah? My personal view is that it's much better to get your students really used to doing D, R, A, B, C, D, R, A, B, C, D, R, A, B, C, and then introduce this magic C when you get on to dealing with bleeding and you're teaching for bleeding. Um, I think, to be honest, um, when people see catastrophic bleeding, Treating that first, even before they've dealt with danger sometimes, because that bright red stuff pumping out tends to get your, in, your attention, doesn't it? So they do it kind of automatically anyway, um, putting C in front of it, airway. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I tend to bring that in later on in the class, um, so I do DRABC first. Um, I think one problem with the primary survey that I've seen, and, um, even in other books, is that people tend to focus on it as being, the, these letters are just about CPR. 
so we only this primary survey is what you do before you do CPR. And of course, it's got a much wider remit than that. Um, and we deliberately, in the call safe books, we didn't use CPR pictures for the primary survey because it's about ruling out all the airway problems and anything that's wrong with the airway, we deal with it at that point. And then anything that's wrong with breathing, we deal with, and anything wrong with circulation that we deal with. Um, okay, the principles. Two very, very simple principles for the primary survey. Okay, the first one if you find a life threatening problem, you deal with it. You deal with it straight away. When you looked at the um, uh, tri triaging of patients, if you come across catastrophic bleeding, even when you're triaging patients, and you're not supposed to treat anybody when you're triaging patients, if you come across catastrophic bleeding, you deal with it there and then because it's top of the shop from the primary survey. Because if, by the time you've uh, triaged the rest of the patients, you're going to come back to that patient and they'll, they'll be dead, won't they? So you deal with it there and then. So when you find a life threatening problem, you deal with it. There's no point dealing with a breathing problem if they've got a blocked airway. Real, real common sense logic. The second big rule is you might not get as far as C. You might not get as far as C. If you end up dealing with um, an airway problem, for example, um, you've got to get, get that airway problem sorted out and get the airway patent before you move on to circulation. You might end up with airway and breathing problems that you end up dealing with, and you're not going to get as far as C. Um, and this is really relevant for this talk, is this? Really relevant indeed, because actually, if you might not get as far as the C just in the primary survey because you're dealing with airway and breathing problems, well, you might not get as far as a secondary survey. And you certainly shouldn't get as far as a secondary survey if you've not ruled out and dealt with airway, breathing, and circulation problems. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a little video here. Um, I did this when I first got on my soapbox back in 2014. So. Right, so come quickly, Phil's collapsed in the warehouse. Okay, I'll check for danger. Look up, look down, look left, look right. Sniff, sniff, make sure it's safe. I'm a first aider, may I help you? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Help! Help! Uh, danger response airway. Open the airway. Get my elbow up. Elbow up. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand, ten thousand. Whew! Thank goodness for that. He's breathing this time. Um, are you my helper? Uh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Right. Can you go get an? 999 for an ambulance and tell them all that stuff that I told you before where we are and everything but this time he is breathing okay thank heaven so just tell them it's somebody who's unconscious tell them to come as quickly as you can and come back and tell me when you've done it okay okay right so danger response airway breathing uh, we're happy with breathing circulation so I'm just going to check for blood make sure there's no bleeding bleeding around the head bleeding on the top no visual underneath his back make sure there's none right under there any blood that could be hiding any blood under the legs just going to check inside your shoes, make sure you're not bleeding inside your shoes. That's great, no bleeding inside the shoes. Oh, fantastic. Right, so uh, now I'm going to do a... Uh, oh, are you, are you my helper? Yes. Right, okay, fantastic. So this time, uh, I need you to tell me, uh, does he have any allergies? Not as far as I know. Okay. Um, uh, is he on any medication? Don't know. You don't know. Uh, did, when did he uh, last have anything to eat? Um, about 30 minutes ago. Okay. Uh, 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 and what, do you know what happened? Events leading to incident, what happened there? No, I haven't a clue. I'm just, I'm just like standing that. like this. Okay, right. I'm a first, aid, uh, first aider. I'm going to help you. So I'm going to check you from top to toe. Is that okay? Just tell me if there's any problems. I'm going to put your, your glasses very carefully in your hand over here. That's it. Let's just pop those in your hand. Lovely. Right, so um, let's just feel your head. That's good. I'm looking inside your ears for any straw-like fluid or any blood. And same from the nose, and we'll have a look at your eyes. Equal and reacting to light, that's lovely. All over the face, check the jaw, feel the back of the neck. Oh, that's clearly not broken, that's great. Um, let's feel the shoulders and the collarbones. 
Yep, they're not broken either. Let's press down on the ribs. Brilliant. Real good squeeze of the ribs. Good, they're not broken. Okay, I'm just going to press on your belly. Okay, that's great. There's no internal bleeding, but we mustn't we mustn't rock the, the, the pelvis. Okay, so I'm going to check your legs next, okay? So I'm just going to check down your leg. All the way down one leg. Great, that doesn't feel like it's broken. Yeah, and we'll just move these. Oh, definitely not broken. That's great. Lovely, that's not broken. And then we'll come up here. Check your arm. Lovely. That's not broken. That's brilliant. And we'll just check this one. Whoop, careful with those glasses. That's not broken. That's lovely. Okay, I'm just going to make sure that there's nothing in your pockets uh, that's going to be uncomfortable because I'm going to turn you on to your side in a minute, okay, to make you more comfortable. So uh, we'll just make sure there's nothing in your pockets. Okay, that's great. Well, I've checked your pockets, so I know there's nothing in your pockets that's going to hurt you. So I'm going to really carefully turn you into the recovery position to make sure that you're okay. In that, if we expected a first aider to do that, there were 50 steps there, I don't know if you all counted them, but there were 50 things that we expected a learner to do, their first aider to do, if we were going to do, teach that routine, before they had even protected the airway. 50 things to do before they'd even thought about protecting the airway, which actually, of course, what comes top of the shop. It's not looking inside somebody's shoes for blood, is it? Yeah, so, um, uh, let me just uh, do a little test with you now, okay? This is an awareness test, okay? Now, um, it's very simple. I want you to look very carefully. Um, I'll, they'll, they'll give you some instructions, but I'll, I'll tell you the instructions in advance. Basically, what you've got to do is when we're looking for the, the basketball team in white, and I want you to count, and we'll see how, if people get this right, I want you to count how many passes the team in white make. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Eleven? Fourteen? The answer is 13. The answer is 13. Put your hand up if you saw the moonwalking bear. Not a lot of people saw the moonwalking bear, did you? But did you see the moonwalking bear? very difficult to spot what you're not looking for. Okay, if we're asking somebody to do a secondary survey on an unconscious casualty that's flat on their back, can we expect them to spot when the patient stops breathing? Probably not, probably not. Okay, so this is a study that was published in Resuscitation Journal just last year actually. It published in June in the Resuscitation Journal. Um, what they did is they got 55 volunteers and they put them on a basic life support uh, course. So they all learnt BLS. Um, but they split them into two groups. Um, 27 um, rescuers, um, uh, 27 students, they were taught to do standard BLS guidelines and place the, the patient in the recovery position as soon as they were breathing. So they did the airway breathing circulation, popped them into the recovery position and they were told you must regularly check breathing whilst this patient is in the recovery position. 28 of the volunteers were taught after the check for breathing and made sure the patient was breathing to keep the casualty on the back, do a head tilt chin lift and to constantly monitor breathing. One week later, they got them back and they got some scuba divers who were very proficient at holding their breath for a very long time. They trained the scuba divers to mimic agonal breathing. Uh, the situation that they put them in is they um, uh, simulated it where the, um, the, the actor had chest pains, they collapsed onto the floor, um, they were expected to follow the BLS protocols. I think they were asked to phone for an ambulance as well. They gave them a phone so they could phone for an ambulance. Um, and then they followed what they'd been taught the previous week. Um, in the first group, um, oh, and uh, 
As they uh, went through the protocols, the uh, scuba diving actor then mimicked going into a respiratory arrest. So they did a few agonal breaths and then held the breath and stopped breathing. Okay, um, uh, And then we saw what happened. Did people follow? Now, only 52% of the standard group recognised within two minutes that the, that the casualty had stopped breathing. So nearly half didn't recognise the fact that, they were, that they'd stopped breathing. Whereas the group that were told to keep the patient flat on the back and just observe them and look at the airway, 82% of those people recognised that the patient had stopped breathing. Quite a significant difference there. 30% more chance of recognising respiratory arrest by keeping the patient on the back. The question is, should we stop teaching the recovery position? Answer A for yes or B for no. I'm very pleased to say the vast majority answered B. No, we should, we, we should not stop teaching the recovery position. Okay. Um, because indeed, it's one study. It's one study. It was actors. You know, it, what it does say, what this study does say, is we need to do more studies, we need more information, so that's, that's true. But the, the Research Council didn't look at this study and go, oh, let's stop teaching the recovery position. You know, we, we've got to look at a broader spectrum than that. But it raises a, a point, doesn't it? It raises a really valid point that if we're asking people to do all the things, then they don't always spot what's, what's right in front of them what, and what we really need them to spot. Yeah? It, it validates the fact that the Research Council have simplified the resource guidelines so much over the past years. You know, since 2005, we've seen massive simplifications to the guidelines. And that's all because we know that when people are in a panicky situation, they don't um, cope with dealing with intricate things and, and, and looking for what we need. When we're teaching first aid, should we not, when we, we teach people to put people in the recovery position, rather than just saying, check breathing regularly, actually what we should be saying to our students is, if it's possible, continually monitor their breathing. Do not stop monitoring their breathing. And don't just tell them to do that, get them to practice doing it. The Daily Mail, of course, uh, decided that we should abandon the recovery <laughs> position. Um, and that literally, within a couple of days of that being published, they were like, uh, uh, very responsible journalism, do not put casualties in the uh, recovery position, researchers say. New first aid guide, says moving patients could have a new first aid guide. I don't know where that one came from. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, it, it just shows you, we, you know, we can look at studies, but we've got to take it as a, a, as a whole picture. Okay, uh, when we come back to the moonwalking bear then, the reason we didn't spot that moonwalking bear is we were giving people, and we, I gave you something complicated to do. You had to count the number of jumps all over and it's exactly the same principle for the secondary survey isn't it if we're giving them something complicated to do then they don't spot what we need them to do okay um, if I um, put a first aider in a situation where um, it's been two years since they went on a first aid course uh, one of the colleagues collapses uh, down in the warehouse they have to run down into the warehouse so, so they run and they're a bit panicky by the time they get there they've got all the colleagues stood over them um, this patient's unconscious flat on the back um, and we've taught them that what they should be doing is doing a full secondary survey on that patient. We could put a room full of dancing bears in front of them and they wouldn't know it's it because they'd be so focused on trying to do what they're doing and they'd be so panicked, yeah? So how on earth can we expect them to tell if the patient stopped breathing? And yet yeah, that's what they should be concentrating on, isn't it? A, B, C, A, B, C. So, <laughs> When people panic, this is another thing, so not only are we giving them something complex to do, but we're giving them something complex to do when they are in a panic and they're in a very stressful situation. Now, physiologically, when you're in a panic and in a, in a stressful situation, your body produces a couple of hormones really quickly. It produces cortisol and it produces adrenaline. Cortisol um, slows down the function of the prefrontal cortex of your brain and uh, that is the area of your brain that you rely on for critical thinking. So that bit where you're going to make some really critical, common sense, logical decisions, it gets slowed down straight away by cortisol. Meanwhile, adrenaline kicks in your flight or fright syndrome, doesn't it? Your flight or fright reaction. Um, so the area of you, the, it, it speeds up the areas of your brain that are like the prehistoric, the, the um, uh, uh, primeval instinct. So you know that, that area of your brain that says duck, so be throwing a punch. That bit speeds up. That bit that says run like hell, that speeds up. But the bit that's saying 
let me open this airway and check for breathing, that bit doesn't get faster. That, unfortunately, that gets impeded. So we've got some chemical issues in, in stressful situations as well. And this, again, it validates completely the reason why the Resus Council have kept the Resus guidelines as simple as possible. The problem is, is that the Resus Council don't give us guidelines on how to do a secondary survey. And in fact, actually, if you look in the Resus guidelines, it doesn't tell you to do a secondary survey. It just says check for breathing, and if they are breathing, put them in the recovery position and constantly monitor the breathing. That brings us on to recognition and management of illness and injury in the workplace uh, unit. And we got some very slight, um, discrete changes to this after quite a few arguments, to be fair. Um, but um, what, we, what we can do with these units, um, so this is the unit behind behind the first aid at work qualification um, and as you can see it says demonstrate um, uh, how to conduct a, a head to toe survey and we can amplify words or phrases within the units and then give it a little bit more guidance so uh, we amplified the, the head to toe survey and the guidance that sits behind that it says um, after much negotiation we managed to achieve this wording um, must be conducted on a casualty with a continually monitored and protected airway e.g. a conscious casualty or a casualty placed in the recovery position. My preferential wording for this was to say that this must be demonstrated on a fully conscious casualty. That was my preference, not on an unconscious casualty at all. Somebody who argued for this said, well, the way that we teach is we teach them to um, uh, check the breathing, check the head, check the breathing, check the neck, check the breathing, check the chest, check the breathing, check their arms, check the breathing, and keep going back to... Now, it's good, it does that, it does get you in the routine of regularly checking breathing, but actually we're not massively complicating something that we should be really keeping very, very simple. Should we not just be saying, continually monitor breathing? If somebody's unconscious, do not stop monitoring breathing. If you put them into the recovery position and protect their airway, great, but do not stop monitoring their breathing. Yeah? Um, and indeed, don't stop monitoring it, if at all possible. So maybe if... Um, you might have to stop monitoring it because you've got to go for 99 or you've got to leave the patient but you come back and you start monitoring it again the second that you come back yeah um, and indeed we've already mentioned if somebody's in the recovery position it's easy to monitor their breathing in that position as well what are the problems with teaching the secondary survey on an unconscious casualty what are the issues with teaching this with somebody on their back i've already highlighted quite a few so the first one is that the airway is at risk while somebody's on the back so is that not primary survey Breathing is not continually monitored. Are these life-threatening issues? They are life-threatening issues. So if these are life-threatening issues, should we be moving beyond the primary survey? Have we got as far as C? We're still on airway and breathing, aren't we? So should we be getting as far as a secondary survey? My argument is no. If somebody's unconscious, we need to keep this really simple for first aiders. It's a really panicky situation. So we should say, phone for an ambulance, protect their airway, and keep, they should just be doing A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, until that ambulance arrives. Nothing else. We shouldn't be getting onto secondary surveys. No need. Okay. Um, it's, if we teach this as standard, um, what happens is it gets performed on casualties who don't need it. The whole point of a secondary survey, the vast majority of those checks that you do when you're doing a secondary survey are looking for injuries. But actually, <coughs> the vast majority of people who collapse in front of first aiders are people who collapse because they're unwell. And that's why they've gone unconscious. Yeah? So we end up putting the airway at risk and the breathing at risk, not paying attention to that, and checking them top to toe and looking at the feet and everything, when all they've done is collapse because they had chest pains. Or, you know? um, so we end up doing it on people that don't need it. Um, you can't rule out fractures, and I've been guilty of this myself. I've felt down somebody's leg before. That's not broken. Hey, <laughs> of course you can't rule out an injury, can you? you can't, we don't have x-ray fingers. So you can't rule injuries out, even though you're checking. You might spot obvious injuries, fair comment, yeah? But you can't rule fractures out. There are problems in the classroom, potentially. Um, is it realistic? Do we have perfectly unconscious patients? We get, you know, in the classroom, we get this person to lay perfectly flat on the back. Does that happen in real life? Not at all. People go semi-conscious. People with head injuries are combative and all sorts of stuff. Um, there's lots of varying levels of consciousness. So actually, this perfectly still unconscious patient very rarely happens, to be honest. Um, trainers touching learners. From an insurance perspective, it frightens me to death, does this? In the, you know, we used to do this no dramas back in the 1990s, no worries. But nowadays, it, it really worries me. You know, people are much more sensitive about these things nowadays. And indeed, you can control 
train as touching learners and what they do, but you can't control your students and you've got, you're asking your students to touch each other as well. So it is an issue. I'm not saying that we should never touch each other, but it's a concern. So it's, you know, um, um, and one concern with doing this on somebody who's pretending to be unconscious is you do have to get them really hands on. Um, where if you're doing this on somebody who's unconscious, you can nearly avoid the hands on bit altogether. Okay. If somebody who is conscious, did I say, is there unconscious? Anyway, I'm going to re ask this question. An unconscious casualty um, is they're unresponsive to pain, so they're right at the bottom of the levels, but they are breathing normally. So, what should the first aider do? Should they A, do a primary survey only, or should they do a primary survey, then a secondary survey? Okay, I don't know how many people voted there, so we have had some still, some people still, still don't agree with me. Come and see me after we have voted B. <laughs> okay. It comes in three parts, okay. Um, there are three different bits that you, can, that you can talk about when you're doing a secondary survey. One, of course, is gathering a good history. So we've got sample, we'll come back to that later. Another one is mechanics of injury, or mechanism of injury, whichever you want to call it. And then your third bit is a top-to-toe survey. So they're the three main component parts of a secondary survey, okay. Um, sample, it's a really good mnemonic for you to remember things that you can ask a patient. And of course we need a patient to be conscious here. We don't want to be messing around with stuff like this unless you're trying to get a history of what's happened. But generally it gets offered up straight away or they're anaphylactic or you know that type of... So it's ideal but it's better for somebody in a nice calm situation where you're thinking right okay, I want to do a real good handover for the ambulance service when they get here. Um, these are the things I can go through. So signs and symptoms, have you got any allergies? Is allergies definitely relevant for first aiders? Only if we think they're having a reaction, or perhaps if we're going to give them an aspirin, that's another good reason to ask for allergies, isn't it? Yeah. So, but other than that, there's not many medications that you give as a first aider. Uh, what medication to take? But can we expect first aiders to, you know, oh yeah, take um, lepiramide, or <laughs> you know, do we expect first aiders to know what what that means, or what what you know? As a paramedic, I look at some medications that people get, and I'm like, well, I've no idea what that is, and I end up googling it, you know, um, because you don't know them all, do you? I'm not a pharmacist. Um, uh, when did they last have anything to eat? Might be relevant if they fainted, um, and then events leading up to the history. So that's actually the more important thing that the first aider could ask is actually what's happened, isn't it? Okay. This mechanics of injury, I think, is significantly not taught enough on first aid courses. Um, I, th this is, for me, one of the most critical things. This is better than a second top to toe survey, is this. Look at what's happened to the casualty. It's really, really, it's not rocket science. Look at what's happened to the casualty. What accident have they just had? And then try and imagine what are the worst possible injuries that they could have having suffered that accident. And treat them for those injuries until you can rule out that they don't have them. Yeah, which is usually when they get into the emergency department, isn't it? Yeah. So it's really straightforward. You don't have to do fancy checks. Just look at what's happened and work out. So if we look at this incident here, for example. So we've got this lady that's been knocked down by a car. What injuries could she have? So first of all, as the car hits her, first impact, knees and legs. Yeah. Um, potentially, if that's it, the upper thigh. That could be a fractured femur. Uh, it could be a fractured femur as the thigh hits the bonnet as she starts to go over the car. Um, what are the worst possible scenarios with a fractured femur? Massive hemorrhage, yeah, you could lose a, a fifth of your blood, you a good litre of blood into your, into your thigh. Hip and pelvis, um, again, what's the a big issue with uh, pelvic fractures? Bleeding, yes, internal bleeding is a massive issue with pelvic fractures and it's one that um, uh, pre-hospital care um, have become uh, much more uh, proactive on in recent years, let me put it that way. There's one big difference that you could make to somebody, and I'm actually going to, if we get time, I'm going to actually show you how to improvise with a triangular bandage, stabilise somebody's pelvis. Um, because stabilising somebody's pelvis could prevent life-threatening bleeding. Um, and for those that saw the Citizen Aid talk, the next version of the Citizen Aid app is going to have a vehicle as a weapon, Ram Raid, included in the app as well um, for tourist incidents. And if you, you know, there's a, tons and tons of casualties because the, a lot of people have been rammed down by a vehicle. Um, what we need to look at for members of the public to be able to do is to do something that might save the casualty's life. Now, we might, with blunt trauma, we not, might not get a lot of external bleeding. But what you do get, and one thing that will kill people quickly, is internal bleeding. So actually, teaching even first aiders, and it's really simple to do, to stabilise a pelvis, 
um, could save a life while we're waiting for that delayed emergency response. Um, so, so just stabilising the pelvis is something that I think is starting, you know, we've kind of shied away completely from triangular bandages and strapping legs together, haven't we? And it's kind of coming back a little bit, but we're not doing it to stabilise fractures. We're doing it because a fractured pelvis is a primary survey problem. It's, a, it's top of the shop catastrophic bleeding, even though we can't see it pouring out, isn't it? Supporting a pelvis is something that's uh, definitely worth doing. Okay, third impact is the head. Of course, what can we look at the vehicle? What might we see? Bullseye on the windscreen. So if we see a bullseye on a windscreen, we know that usually there's been quite a significant either shoulder or head injury at that point. Yeah. Uh, look at her neck as she's hit the car as well. So the next bit is the spine. And then, of course, what might happen? You know, we teach people to look at uh, when should you suspect a spine injury? Well, if you suspect a spine injury, for example, good, good thing, somebody's fallen from a horse or from the height of a horse or, or, a bit, or higher than that, always treated for spinal injury. Well, this lady's already potentially got a spinal injury just by hitting the car, but she then might get thrown up in the air, higher than the height of a horse, and land on the floor again. And it depends how she lands as to what injuries that's going to cause. So there are multiple mechanisms of injury in this incident. So just looking at what's happened to the casualty. So with this lady, we should be treating her for the worst, which is C-spine injuries and possibly a fractured pelvis. And if she's conscious, we need to be just ABC, 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 think about the pelvis if she's got a lot of pain in her pelvis um, and keeping on with ABC and it's primary survey stuff again. Um, uh, and C-spine of course is airway C-spine if, you, if you're a clinician. Okay. But the top to toe survey um, is uh, very methodical, as you're aware, a very methodical top to toe, and we've done it in the books where you go down the centre of the body from the, from the head down to the toes and come back up and do the arms last. And kind of by doing that, and it's not perfect, but you're kind of doing the more important things first, are you, by starting out of the head and working down. Okay. Um, now, as trainers, you're not just expected to teach the secondary survey, you're also expected to assess the secondary survey. Um, to, it's you know, it's a, a, a one of the practical assessments for the first aid at work course. So I thought it would be useful for me actually to cover over some basics of assessment as well that are very easy to forget. Okay, three key things when we're assessing students. First one is it's authenticity. This is fairly straightforward. What do we mean by authenticity? Anybody? Yeah, kind of. Actually, I'm, I'm going to come back to that because that's another word I'm using. But authenticity from an assessment thing is it's really simple. It's the, the, it's the student's own work. So you're not telling them what to do. They've got, you know, they've learned it and they're doing it. Simple as that. It's the student's own work. And they've not colluded when they're doing multiple choices, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, so actually, what did you say about then? Validity is just that. So validity is... It's got to measure what we say it's got to measure. So would it be acceptable for, for me to say to a student, OK, can you describe how to do a secondary survey? It's, they've got to do it, haven't they? It's a practical skill. So if they try to describe it, that would, it wouldn't be a valid assessment. What we're actually, the assessment is that they can do it. Yeah? Um, a classic one with validity, where people fall foul of validity. Um, you teaching CPR... And somebody does chest compressions at like um, 80 beats per minute. They're going really slow, okay? So they're doing chest compressions at 80 beats per minute. And the classic is that the assessor goes, at the end of it, how fast should you have been going there? And the student goes, oh, well, I should have been doing 100 to 120 beats per minute. Perfect. And they tick them off. Does that tell you that they can do CPR at 100 to 120 beats per minute? It's not valid, is it? It's not a theory question. You've got to see them do it. So that's what validity means, OK? And then the last one is reliable. Now, I'm really sorry about this because as a first aid trainer, reliability is boring. It is absolutely boring because re what we mean by reliability, OK? Reliability is... Um, if a student performs exactly the same uh, when they get assessed a second time, it shouldn't matter who the assessor is, who the centre is, or even when they did that assessment, they should get exactly the same result. Yeah? If a student performs exactly the same, 
and they did repeat an assessment and they perform exactly the same again, they should get exactly the same result. And that's quite a challenge when you're assessing. And actually, I can remember the days of first aid at work when we used to have a four day first aid at work course, and um, we used to get assessors in at the end of the course. Uh, to come and do some, some practical like, assessments with the students. And of course, the assessors, that's all they ever did. They came in and did these, and they used to get bored. So they changed the scenarios every time. One minute, the, somebody's fallen off of a wall, and the next minute, somebody just collapsed with chest pains. And, and if you change the scenario every single time, how do you achieve re reliability? You can't, can you? So actually, that's why I say it's boring for trainers, because actually, to achieve reliability, we've got to all do it exactly the same. And that's not just... Um, you always doing it the same, it's actually every single quad safe centre doing it exactly the same. So we should all be doing exactly the same scenario. And that's why actually we keep the scenarios really simple. Um, we should all be doing exactly the same scenario and assessing using the same guidance. So actually I'm going to quickly go through the guidance with you um, uh, that goes with this. Okay. So as you're aware on the assessment sheets we've got these things to go through. These are the little tick boxes that we have for um, uh, assessing somebody when they're doing the secondary survey. So the first one, um, this is the guidance. So they've got to obtain history and ask what happened. And literally, it's quite easy to do. We would, it doesn't have to be complicated, does this? We want the secondary survey to be really simple. So, if the student asks for an explanation, what can you tell me what happened? Or if they ask bystanders what happened? Or if they ask about the casualties medical history, that might be relevant. So that's the, they're asking about the history. Or even if they ask about melergy, allergies, medication, anything like that, then they're obtaining a history and they are working out what's happened. Okay, so we can tick a box. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, asks or looks for signs and symptoms. It's quite difficult not to tick this box if somebody has done a top-to-toe survey because all the way through doing a secondary survey you are looking for signs, aren't you, and clues, yeah? Okay, um, so if they ask the casualty how they're doing, um, how they're feeling, if they've got any pain, if they make an observation, so I've noticed that they've gone pale, for example, um, or they carry out a top-to-toe survey and they're looking for signs. Like I say, it's very difficult not to tick that box if they do a secondary survey. Asking for consent, that's in there, because there there's actually a, um, uh, an assessment criteria on consent, so we make sure we pop it in there. So it's just a case of, particularly if you were going to do hands-on, you should always check with the patient that it's okay to do that. Um, but it's just to get good to get your, your patient on board anyway, your casualty on board. So something simple like, okay, I just want to check your top to toe, is that alright? No, it just needs to be a quick, simple question like that. Breathing. Uh, makes a quick judgment on the breathing, so um, they're looking at um, is it normal, fast, shallow, or if they measure the breathing rate. If somebody measures a breathing rate, um, what should we, is there, there's one thing we need to avoid doing. Is anybody telling me that? Telling them that you're doing it. <laughs> Do not tell them that you're doing it. Yeah. A good way to uh, measure somebody's breathing rate, if you're going to measure somebody's breathing rate, I'm just going to feel your pulse and put the hand across the chest. And actually what you're measuring is the chest going up and down, not the pulse. Yeah, and they think you're feeling the pulse. As soon as I say to you, I'm just going to check your breathing, what do you do? <laughs> you hold your breath, you manually control your breathing. Okay, so you cannot tell them that you're doing it. Okay. Um, I'm not particularly suggesting that we need to spend 30 seconds assessing breathing even for first aiders. We need to keep the secondary survey really simple for them. So for me, if they just make a judgement that your breathing looks normal, does it feel normal? They're talking to them, they're fully conscious. How's your breathing? Does it feel normal? Yeah, great, it looks normal to me, brilliant, move on. Yeah. So they're not even doing a full measurement. Okay. Or they might comment that your breathing seems a bit fast, or it seems a bit laboured, or it seems a bit wheezy. Yeah. Um, the pulse. Again, do we spend hours and hours nowadays um, teaching first aiders how to feel pulses? And is it an easy task to do? It's actually really difficult, this feeling for a pulse and measuring a pulse. Um, if somebody was very proficient at it, I wouldn't have a problem with the measuring a pulse for 15 seconds and working out whether it's regular, irregular, that might give you a bit of a clue. Um, but actually, much simpler than that is a capillary refill test, isn't it? Squeeze the finger, does that fill back up within a couple of seconds? Brilliant, that's reasonable circulation. Okay, perfectly accepted uh, in the clinical world as well, is that for uh, doing a quick assessment of, uh, of circulation. Pupils. Um, they might want to look at the pupils. So I think it's worthwhile looking at the pupils and checking that they're both equal. That's fair enough, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, whether you're going to measure that it's reacting to light or not, and you know, shining a torch in and out of their eyes is probably not something that a first day you might just get your, you get your phone out nowadays, couldn't you? And maybe shine that in and out of their eyes. But um, I think um, for me, at, for, for, at a first aid level, are the pupils equal? 
doesn't need to be any more difficult than that. Head and face, okay. Um, so this is actually really easy to fill this box in, although when we're doing the demonstration later on, there's lots of things that you can look at when you're looking at somebody's head, you know, bleeding out of ears, all sorts of stuff. So we'll come back to that. But, uh, but with this, again, we need to keep the assessment criteria simple. So with this, we would tick the box if they looked at the head of the face, they appeared to check it over, um, they looked for abnormality. If they looked for bleeding coming from ears, anything like that, um, uh, if they asked the casualty if they got any pain, because you're talking to them, they're fully conscious, absolutely fine. Uh, the neck, the biggest thing for me with neck injuries is not necessarily feeling for somebody's neck. Let's come back to what we talked about, about mechanism of injury. That is the biggest important thing with broken necks. And in fact, actually, the mechanism of injury will potentially affect completely how you approach the patient in the first place. So are you going to walk up and kneel down the side of this patient or actually you're going to walk straight up to them and take control of the C-spine? And that, that's completely down by looking at mechanics of injury. Okay, um, uh, but we might want to feel the neck and actually if you check that they've got no pain in the neck, it's okay to just gently pop your fingers down the centre of the spine and say, is it tender? Because that's one thing we would check to make sure again as we're ruling out. I'm going to come on to ruling out um, injuries in a lot more detail later on. Shoulders, so we look for abnormality. Um, I'm not a big fan of like running your fingers across collarbones and stuff. If we've got somebody who's conscious, we can just say, how do your shoulders feel? I, have you got any pain in them? Yeah, as simple as that. Collarbones, how does that feel? Um, the chest. Um, if we've got somebody who's conscious, we can ask them to take a deep breath in and out. So if we ask the patient to take a deep breath in, and back out again, what has that just told us? What have we assessed there? If we look really carefully at the chest, what are we looking for? So we're looking at bilateral chest movement. Do both lungs go up equally and go down? So we're looking at, is the chest even? That's one big thing to look for. And of course, the other thing is, what have they just done with the ribs as they've just gone? <sighs> yeah, so if they were, it would give them some pain if there were any rib issues, wouldn't it? So we're assessing for pain again. Okay. Um, and that avoids you having to put your hands on and rock the rib cage, doesn't it? Just get the patient to breathe in and out. Um, ask the casualty if they've got any abdominal pain. Um, you'll note here that it doesn't say palpate the abdomen. Okay, um, I used to teach this, palpate the abdomen, brilliant. Okay, but what are we expecting a first aider to achieve by palpating the abdomen? So pressing down in four areas on, on the belly. What might they detect when they're looking at that? Costing. Say again? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good idea. Good answer. <laughs> Colostomy, she said, if you didn't hear that at the back. Um, uh, we might say, okay, well, we want them to detect internal bleeding. Yeah. But how much of your blood will fit in your abdomen? All of it. Every last drop will fit in your abdomen, yeah? Uh, but by which time are we actually getting into sort of like third stages of shock? Three pints, two pints, we, it's getting very, very serious by two pints. You pour two pints of blood into somebody's abdomen, that is not easy to feel. But by this stage, they are already very ill. But I'll tell you something, noticing that they're looking really pale, that's really obvious, yeah? So it's looking for simple things. So pressing down on their abdomen and that the fact they've got pain in the stomach, you know, if they're conscious. Um, so um, uh, there's a note there that the pelvis should not be rocked and squeezed. Why should we not do that? What have we just said earlier on? We, yeah. So, with pelvic fractures, um, the, w the weakest point of your pelvis is the bit where it joins at the bottom. So, um, and that's one big problem is this, uh, they call it a book fracture. So, um, one big problem, and the reason it's good to stabilise a fracture is that when somebody's laid on the back and their legs splay out, it does this with the pelvis and it splays it outwards, that can damage. We've got um, massive blood vessels that run very, very close to your bones, and that can damage those blood vessels. So we can end up with massive internal bleeding. So actually stabilising somebody's pelvis in that position, because we, we don't want to be squeezing it either. We used to teach, when I first started teaching first aid training, that's what we taught them to do. That's completely been ruled out nowadays. Next one, uh, the legs. So um, have a look at the legs. Uh, ask them if they've got um, any pain in the legs. Um, I tend to what I would say when I'm doing, and I'll demonstrate this as well, when I'm talking to a conscious casualty, I'd say, okay, think really carefully, have you got any pain generally in your body, and then I'd concentrate on each area one by one before we, before we can rule it out, okay? Um, the scenario that we need to use, by the way, I forgot to mention this, the scenario that we need to use, again, in order to achieve reliability, so that it doesn't matter which 
Walpole Safe Centre to do this assessment in, we've got to use the same scenario. So therefore that scenario needs to be quite simple. So what we're suggesting that you do with this is that the secondary survey is, uh, the scenario is quite simple. Somebody has slipped on a wet floor, they've landed on the backside, they're on the floor and it's really shook them up. It shook them up and they're panicking. Somebody's run for the first aider and said, can you come and check them out please? And the first aider arrives. And it's quite simple that the first aider needs to do a, a methodical top-to-toe survey before they go, come on then, stand up, you're all right. Yeah, and it's, that's, that's the scenario. And also, the patient needs to be uninjured. They need to be uninjured. Because as soon as you start throwing in, oh yeah, I've got pain in my elbow, that blows the reliability of the assessment. And actually, what are we assessing? Are we assessing their ability to deal with that elbow injury? we're assessing their ability to carry out a thorough top-to-toe survey. So that's why we suggest that the patient is uninjured. So if they've slipped on some water or some ice or something uh, and they're just a bit shook up, they're uninjured, but we, we need to check them out top-to-toe. So that's the scenario that we use. Um, so yeah, I'd say, you know, I'd check them out and after legs, I'd say, okay, um, uh, well, I'll come back to it. I'll, I'll, I'll come, on, come on to that when I do a demonstration. Uh, logically move to the rounds as well. Um, if you're suspecting things like drugs, then you might want to have a look for tracking marks. Um, but that's coming on to clues anyway, really. But again, you're just looking for injuries. Wiggle, can you wiggle your fingers? Can you move? Um, can you squeeze your, my hands? So we're checking, you know, well, let's do a fast test while we're doing a secondary survey as well. Um, uh, and then um, ask them to move the joints, providing they've got no pain. And another thing is always reassure to say, look, if, if anything hurts, don't do it. So I'm, I'll ask you to move your arm, but if it hurts, don't move it. Just tell me it hurts. Yeah? So you're not asking them to do anything that's going to hurt them or cause it, make it worse. Um, on the check sheet, I, I only noticed this the other week actually, it still says on the, the uh, course of assessments, it still says pockets or clues. What do we think about going through patients' pockets? Not a big fan of it. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, if they were unconscious and you wanted to find out some reasons why they're unconscious, but there again, as a first aider, should we not be concentrating on ABC? So actually, if somebody's conscious, there's no need to go through the pockets anyway, is there? Because you can talk to them and ask them questions, yeah? So certainly for this secondary survey, when we're talking about doing it on a conscious patient, I don't think we should be encouraging them to go through pockets. If you do go through pockets, you need to be, think about needles, anything that could injure you. Um, there are um, issues of, you know, always get a witness to make sure and, and explain what you're doing. And I'm not robbing this person. i actually looking in their handbag to find, you know, anything, who the next of kin is or if there's any medical problems, that type of thing. Um, not a big fan of it because for me, when it's getting to the stage of going through um, pockets to find out more about your patient, then that tells me that that patient is not conscious enough to be protecting their own airway potentially. So actually, should we just be sticking to ABC? My opinion is probably we should be sticking to ABC rather than messing around with next to kins and that sort of stuff. All right, it might be a second person's job while somebody is just concentrating on ABC and nothing else. Somebody else might want to work out who they are and who to call and that type of thing. That's, that's, that's reasonable. Okay. We'll go through a secondary survey. How's that? We'll, 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 we'll put into practice what I've just been saying about uh, demonstrating this in the classroom on somebody who slipped on some water. So we'll go through that, that demo. Can I have a volunteer? So, uh, sounds like a silly question, John, but can you tell me what month it is? Yeah, it's April. April, excellent, good stuff. So we know he's, he's fully orientated, so therefore he's, um, okay. And um, I'll ask him all the questions about uh, have you got pain, um, painkillers, um, drugs, alcohol, nothing like that? No. no, okay. Don't you have to shake your head while you're answering me, by the way. They always go like that, don't they? But I'm not worried about neck injury, we're all right. Um, uh, uh, fully orientated. Okay, so right, so we, I'm going to come back on to ruling out pain further on. So first of all, I've just checked in top to toe, as in think really carefully, you've got no pain. Happy with that? No. Okay, that's great. So, right, John, I want to check you out, first of all. Um, the only place I would place my hands when I'm checking somebody out is potentially around the head and above the shoulders. I do, as a first aid, I don't really need to be doing any lower than that, okay? It, I think it is fine to check around somebody's head, that's okay, all right? So, I'm just going to check your head, is that all right? Do you mind yep. if, I, yep. if I assess you? I'm just going to assess you top to toe, is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. So, just check your head and make sure there's no pain there and no tenderness. And if anything hurts, I want you to tell me straight away, that okay? Yeah. So, I'm looking at his ears. When we're looking at ears, what are we looking for potentially with head injuries? Cerebrospinal fluid. So do we see this perfect straw-coloured cerebrospinal fluid coming out of somebody's ear? It's usually gone through a few membranes to get there, so actually it's, it, it's mixed with blood, yeah. So it's likely it could be watery blood or blood. 
Yeah, my experience is it just looks like blood every time I've seen this. I've not seen it many times, but when I have seen it, it just looks like bleeding from the ear. Okay, um, uh, so we think about his ears, that's great. Can I just have a look at your eyes? Can you just close your eyes for me and then open them nice and wide? I'm just looking at your pupils there, and they look fantastic, that's great. Can you give me a nice smile? <laughs> hey, okay. <laughs> Fabulous, did we get that? So what we're looking at there, that's a little bit of a fast test, isn't it, yeah? So if, if there's anything stroke involved, anything like that, why did he fall? Um, just think about your neck for me now. Do you have any pain in your neck? No. no. You can ask leading questions in if you don't want them to have any pain. I, I would, if, I, if I didn't want my patient to have pain in the neck, I'd be going, you don't have any pain in your neck, do you? <laughs> Great, so you don't have any pain in your neck, do you? No. Okay, I'm just going to feel the back of your neck and make sure if this hurts, tell me. Is that all right? Yeah. No pain? No. None at all. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, so, um, everything looks fine with his head. No bumps, bruises, anything abnormal. Pupils equal. Look to his ears. Fantastic. Move down to his C-spine. So now let's have a think about your shoulders. Right. How do you think about your shoulders? How do they feel? No pain in your shoulders? No. Okay. Um, can you do me a favour? Can you take a real deep breath in and out? If anything hurts, don't do it. But just take a real deep breath in and back out again. That's fabulous. Did that didn't, didn't cause any pain? No. And again, what I've looked for there is bilateral chest movement. So both sides of his chest have lifted and gone back down again. And at the same time, we've just completely checked his, his entire rib cage, haven't we? At the same time, that would have given him some pain, okay? Um, so uh, at the, the other thing I noticed about your breathing is it, it just seems quite normal. Do you, do you yeah. think it's normal? Is it normal for you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, and it seems normal. So we've talked about breathing rate. Okay, that's great. Let's move on to your stomach. How does your stomach feel? Fine. No pain in it anywhere? No. Nope. That's great. I don't need him to start pressing down on his belly, anything like that. If he had pain in his stomach, he'd have pain in his stomach. Yeah? Okay. Fabulous. Out. What about your hips? Do they feel all right? Yeah, great. Yeah, lovely. Fantastic. Um, what about your, your, your legs? Do your legs feel okay? Yes, feel fine. They feel great. Okay. Can you wiggle your toes for me? There we go. That's great. Can you just really carefully move your ankles? Don't move anything else, just your ankles. And if anything hurts, don't do it. Lovely. Can you bend your knees really carefully because it's going to move your hip as well. So is that all right? No pain? No. And the other hip. Does that feel okay? Yeah. Yeah, good. Think about your spine all the way down your back. How does that feel? Normal. No pain? Brilliant. Um, can you wiggle your fingers for me? That's great. Um, can you uh, move your wrists and then your elbows? And then how about your shoulder joints? Yeah. That all feel good. Do you want to give me both your hands? And can you uh, squeeze my hands? Squeeze them, that's great. Okay, just relax. Push down on my hands. Push down. That's great. So we've just done a bit more of a fast test there as well. And obviously, he's got no pain anywhere. He's even been able to push down, which put quite a bit of pressure on his shoulders. Um, uh, another quick thing I need to just do is just squeeze your finger, if that's all right. Sure. Yep. A little bit delayed there. I think you might be a bit cold on that finger. Let's just warm it up. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've done a bit of a capillary. So we've looked at breathing. We've looked at pulse. We've uh, done a th full thorough history. Okay. I'm, I'm fairly comfortable that you've not hurt yourself. Do you feel the same? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Now this is really important, I think, from a first aider's, from a first aider's perspective, because first aiders are not doctors. Yeah. They're not paramedics. So it's really not their responsibility to go. You're fine to move. Get up, mate. So actually, getting your patient to buy into the fact that they're uninjured and they agree with you, I think is really important. Yeah? Because it's your patient's decision now. We've calmed them down. We've done a top-to-toe -to survey. It's your patient's decision to decide that they're uninjured, isn't it? Yeah? So I'm really happy. I don't think I've identified any serious injuries. Do you feel like the same? No, yeah? Okay, yeah. okay, right. Well, really carefully, let's try and sit you up. Okay, I'm not going to stand you up fully. Well, let's just try and sit you up a little bit. Now, can we just grab a chair? Pass me a chair. That's good. Thank you. Pinch, pinch your seat. Sorry about that. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'm going to pop this chair here. What you can do is just put your hands on there and sit yourself up onto that. Just hold up. All right. How does that feel? Yeah, that's good. Okay. You've not gone dizzy? No. Nope. You feel all right? Yeah. Feel good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you want to just carefully use this chair and stand up? And I'm using a bit of a chair, then he's not leaning on me and falling on me. These are the things that a paramedic would have to go through to rule out a C-spine injury, okay? So there's been no dangerous mechanism of injury. Uh, what we're talking about there is, okay, if somebody is an innocent micro and they've got a bit of a bumped bumper on the car, do we need to be worried about having a broken neck? Probably not. If they're in a Volvo with a squashed engine, do we need to be worried about having a broken neck? That's a big mechanism of injury, okay? Uh, so no pain, no tenderness from reduced conscious levels. No signs and symptoms of nerve damage. You see, he could feel and he could move his hands and everything there, and he could move his legs. 
Um, no painkillers, drugs, alcohol, or other distracting injuries. That's the other one we never mentioned, yeah? If somebody has got a broken femur, is that gonna be slightly distracting potentially for a broken neck? Big style, yeah? But having said that, if they've had an accident that's caused a broken femur, it's probably one way you're gonna think, I'm going to immobilise the C-spine as well because it's been a hell of an accident as this. Yeah, so you would do it automatically. Okay, um, they're able to move without pain and like I said right at the bottom, this is the important one for first aid because they're not going to remember that big long list. More importantly, the casualty agrees with you, they are not injured. Okay, um, I'm going to call it to a draw there. Thank you very much. Cheers guys.